picture of um, being the MC, facilitator, chair, whatever you'd like to call me tonight. Um, and just let you know that this is being recorded. Um, and if you could all put yourselves on mute and use the chat function so that we can make sure that um, everyone uh, has uh, their questions uh, noted and we can get to them as through the night if we can do. Um, I'd like to hand over to um, Rosalie, who's very kindly um, said that she would do the acknowledgement tonight. So thank, take, thank you, Rosalie, and take it away. You're on mute. Sorry, Rosalie. Thank I got a message from Emma at some stage, and I think I ignored it for a few hours. <laughs> I realised I came up with something different. But I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and live. For me, it is the land of the Pequorong, people of the Ma Gunditch Mara Nation. We pay our respects to the people and the elders of the past, present and emerging. We recognise the importance of continued connection to culture, country and community. I acknowledge the sovereignty of the First Nations people who for 65,000 years have nurtured and lived in harmony with this beautiful land. Let's walk together to bring healing and reconciliation for our future. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, we come from various different lands tonight, so um, I acknowledge all the lands that we are on tonight. Um, so I would like to uh, first uh, introduce our speakers for tonight. We have, um, most of you would already know them. We have our beautiful Abby from the Ops team. We have our wonderful Margaret uh, from the uh, Capacity and Capability team or the Volunteer Guru person. Uh, we have Megan Barry, which is from the Ops team as well, and we have uh, some representatives from the Kazi team and um, from the Food Relief team. So we've got some lots of guest speakers tonight and hopefully it's going to be a really informative night for you all. So please, um, if you have any questions or comments, please pop them in the chat and we'll certainly get to them when we can. We have some question and answer opportunities coming up during the night as well. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the first uh, speakers for tonight. Um, and that is Abby and Megan. Thanks, Emma. Hi, everybody. Lovely to see you all almost face to face. Very nice to see you. Megan is just pulling up um, our slides to do our presentation at the moment. And while she's doing that, I might just introduce um, Megan Barry because uh, many of you in this room may not know her, but uh, Megan has come in to help the operations and logistics team with some of the, implementing some of the recommendations um, for the IMT. Um, Megan's been here for about three months now and has got a little bit to go um, on her contract, but we've had some really great achievements and Megan and I are going to share this presentation um, as we give you a high level overview of, of where we've come from over the past 12 months and what we've achieved. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please, Megan. It's a bit of a shame I just introduced Megan, but you can't see her, uh, maybe <laughs> after the presentation. Um, just trying to go to the next slide. Sorry, don't know why this is working. There we go. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to give an overview of the project, and really, it's it's about 12 months worth of work. I think um, uh, that that was in this project. Then I'm going to hand over to um, Megan to start talking about three of the key outputs of this project. So the first one was around process mapping of which we have done an extraordinary amount over the past 12 um, months. Um, and this third, the second one I'm going to talk to is around the documenting, of which we've also done a lot of documenting over the past couple of months. And then the fourth one, really quickly, we'll talk about uh, the shift checklist, which was another key output which was identified that we really needed. Just really quickly before we commence, I think it's worthwhile. Um, the INT unit leads should be very much congratulated for their work over the course of the past 12 months. Um, even during activations, we've still managed to meet twice a month, every month, really consistently to keep this work on track. Um, Peter Gerzik, some of you may know, he's a volunteer in the INT and the operations team, has been a really, really big driver um, of this project as well and has dedicated quite an extraordinary amount of time and his expertise. Uh, and then Megan Barry also who's come on um, in the last bit of this project just really to help it, uh, to help bring it alive. 
Next slide. Thanks, Megan. Um, so this is a bit about project overview. I think I've probably shared this in the state office report a few times, and this is pretty high level, but um, it probably it really started in January, but in, in May to July this year, we really got stuck down in the detail. We had um, somebody come in and do an external consultancy. So they really unpacked everything that we did in the IMT and kind of presented back to us what they think um, would help improve some of our structural issues and some of our processes. Everything was already all there. It just needed to be uh, unpicked and unpacked and dusted off. Um, so we identified some structural and procedural areas for improvement. And we also looked at the recommendations from the after action reviews of which many people in this room have contributed to over the past couple of years. Um, so from all of that, we generated a really big um, work plan. It's when Megan, um, we were lucky enough to get Megan on. Um, and between that time and now, our key outputs were, we workshopped and mapped out all of the IMT processes. So anything you possibly could think that is one of your tasks in the incident management team, we've mapped it out and we know exactly how it should work and who should be doing what. So from that, um, we've produced about 40 documents, so a whole suite of documents, just how-to documents for the incident management team, including guidelines and checklists and procedures, um, just to make it really clear there's no single point of dependency anymore, make it quite accessible for anyone to come and have an opportunity to work in the IMT. Um, we completed a simulation where we tested some of these our theories and our procedures and the things that worked kept and the things that didn't, we adjusted. Um, and we've really enhanced the way the IMT uses some of our systems like MS Teams um, for face-to-face -face and for our virtual working styles. So just really tailored it. <clears throat> and the next steps for 2022, um, we know that we need to recruit for some really key, really specific um, roles. Um, we need to update all of our training packages to reflect the new changes. Um, we really need to provide ongoing training to people in the IMT to really embed the new processes so they don't get forgotten about. <clears throat> we'll also be rolling out mobile data collection um, uh, via an app next year. So we'll be saying goodbye to the paper, um, but you know, you'll all be along for the journey of that as well. We're just starting that. Um, and then we'll review everything again, just to double check that it's that it's all right and we've made the right decisions at the end of financial year. Thanks, Megan. So I'll hand over to Megan now. So we'll talk a really high level about our three major outputs, and one of them um, was around process mapping. So I, I don't hope you hopefully you guys don't find this too boring, but for me this was uh, pretty exciting and integral bit to provide clarity for all of the units and everybody who sits outside of the IMT as well. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Abby. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. 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 Clear. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so one of the documents or the process that we initially looked at, um, which kind of set the scene for a lot of the other documentation that was put together for this review, was looking at receiving tracking and responding to activation requests. And it's kind of a capstone document for the IMT in that it maps out that whole process from receiving that request through to getting our teams in the field and, and deployed with everything that they need. Um, just to highlight again, I think Abby already mentioned it, a significant amount of work went into mapping this process earlier in the year before I started with the IMT function leads and the work that was done there formed the basis, I guess, for the document that I'm about to show you and also all of the other documentation that we put together. So again, a massive thank you to the IMT function leads given the busyness of everybody this year still managed to put in this work, which was really, um, I guess, the foundation for the work that I've done. Um, just in after action reviews, uh, you know, a number of procedural issues were identified within the IMT. I guess issues with clarity between the functions um, that needed to be ironed out a little bit. It was all there, as Abby said, but just needed to be unpicked and sort of put back together. Um, and also highlighting the different roles between the different teams as an activation request is received and then through to getting the teams deployed in the field. And so that was um, that was sort of the basis around this process mapping to make sure that all the units are clear on roles and responsibilities. And by doing that, I think hopefully that will enable the IMT to better support the volunteers that are working in the field. So process mapping, 
I don't expect that you'll be able to read all the little parts of this, um, but I just wanted to give you an overview. And certainly this document will be provided in the document pack that you get after this um, meeting. So you can have a look in a bit more detail if it interests you. Um, but it was basically splitting up the different functions within the IMT and then working through all of the processes and making sure it was clear where responsibility sat for certain parts of the process. Um, overall, obviously the command has overall management for the activation and for personnel. And early on, um, also acknowledging the key risks and escalating them early on if necessary in that activation request process. And then safety and well-being have quite an important role to play during this initial process. And so mapping out all of the things that they are required to do as we receive an activation request through to getting people in the field um, was really important. And the work that they do actually links in with a whole lot of other processes within the IMT. Um, so they have input and manage the risk assessments, input into the pre-deployment questionnaire processes, um, as well as input into the SMEACs, which all of you would have seen if you're working in the field, that you would have seen SMEACs and relied on them for all the information that you need. Um, so we basically reviewed all of these processes with the function leads and, and mapped out this document. So the document, um, you can see the flowchart. It's a huge flowchart. We had to fl split into two so we could fit everything in there. Um, so as you can see as well, logistics planning play a key role in that initial part of the activation. So identifying the key roles that are required for the activation. And then once that's sort of, they've gotten up to that point in the process, logistics are then responsible for identifying specific people to fill those roles and then for getting those people into the field and supporting them to get there with the appropriate travel accommodation and any other logistics support that they need. And once people are in the field, obviously, as you know, that the operations team then take over the management of the field teams and manage all of the field reporting and all of the incoming communications from the field teams. So that's sort of how I guess the roles are split up as well. So with the document, we've tried to number all the steps and then with the steps um, underneath the flow chart is a bit more detail on that step as well as all the documentation that's required to do that step. So it will refer to specific templates or other SOPs. So you can work through all of those steps. And again, hopefully this um, delineation of responsibility or making it clear for IMT roles will mean that they provide better support to our teams in the field, which is obviously the main aim. And so that's basically what the document looks like. And as I said, you'll get um, a better chance to look at that when we send out the packs and it will have the document in there. If you're interested, you can click through and look at the other documents that link in with this particular capstone document. Um, I think that's pretty much it for this particular document. Abby, did you have anything else you wanted to add for that one? No, that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Great. So the other um, key output was documenting. So um, what we'd found through after action reviews and consultancy work is there was not very much that was documented in the IMT. So we would quite often, you know, have to create new processes on the fly and that would mean it would be unclear for not just the IMT, but people in the field and divisional operations officers as well. So we thought, right, we need to get everything documented and that will help us reduce single point dependencies. Um, and it also means that knowledge is shared. And so if we want other people to come into the IMT and have a real Really great experience it means we can say great here's the list of documents everybody's got the same thing we're all on the same page here um, if you don't mind popping to the next slide Megan <clears throat> so really wanted we've, we've developed a suite it's about 40 processes that we documented so we've got shift checklists we've got standard operating procedures and we've got guidelines for pretty much every one of those tasks that Megan talked us through which means getting an activation request in the IMT um, and getting people deployed. So we've got the entire suite of supporting documentation for every process. This is accessible to everybody. This is a beautiful document that's all hyperlinked, which we can share with you as well. There's no um, secrets here, and that's for all of us um, to use and to share. This is a 
big combination of all the nationally consistent resources as well. So we haven't stepped to the side. We've used everything nationally. Um, so if you work in the IMT in Victoria, um, if you use these resources, you'll be familiar if you get deployed to an IMT in Queensland or to another um, state. Um, we've just really fattened them up a little bit and given a bit more instruction step by step on how to do tasks. Thanks, Megan. And then the last um, big key output was shift checklists. We realised that our shift checklists were a little bit dated. They didn't have the information that people needed. And what we really want is when someone sat at, down at their table, whether they're working um, in the EOC or they're working virtually, that they just had a little package that had everything that they needed um, uh, in it and away they went. Um, again, everybody's got access to exactly the same information. Um, and if we have somebody new or somebody who's been in the IMT for many shifts, they'll all get the same package and we'll all be on the same page. So this is a quick example of the commander one. Again, we'll send you a copy of this so you can have a squiz. Each of the functions um, have this produced for them. On the left hand side, it's a little bit hard to see, but all your core documents are hyperlinked in there. Your VRD, the role capability standards, um, all of those big umbrella documents, the state emergency management plan that you need to refer to a lot on shift, has your role overview, all your login details there. So we do use a few generic logins in the IMT, everything listed, and then all the actual checklists have reflected, um, now reflect the new process changes in the IMT. So really, if there's just one thing that you can get when you sit down at your desk, it's just this um, and away you go and you can just follow it step by step. All the supporting documents are all linked in there as well. So that's it for the um, three key outputs and, and that's it for um, our presentation. So we did go over the, the next steps, I guess, out of the, the probably key thing to remember from the next steps is none of this is set in stone. This is our first first draft or, or you know phase one of all these documents we'll be testing them over the next six months so we'll have a couple of exercises we'll have other people contribute and give feedback um, and then at the end of financial year we'll review them again so if they're not right or somebody says hey that's not how we do it or we should change this because it doesn't work um, all of that feedback will be included in six months and be considered in six months and we'll reissue them I think that's it Wonderful. Thank you so much, Abby. Megan, it was an amazing project and um, sounds like a oh, huge amounts of work and um, I think it's going to make a huge difference to everyone and um, I know that you're going to welcome feedback um, along the way. I know that we have some question time after the next um, presentation, so don't um, hold back with your questions um, to, for too much longer. We, we do have some time. So I'd like to welcome the next presenters along um, and that is Margaret and Abby again. Um, and they will be presenting um, about uh, who's who in the zoo. So um, take it away, Margaret and Abby. Thank you. Gosh, I, we've, I hope everybody doesn't get uh, too sick of my voice, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll speak really quickly. Um, Margaret's got a lovely slide that she's going to pull up and share on her screen. <clears throat> Um, and while Margaret gets that up, I'll just give a little bit of context. I know at the last uh, readiness session with the feedback that came through, there was a little bit um, or, or, or the group wanted to get some clarity about the reporting lines in an activation and where to go for help and then the reporting lines at all other times, so outside of a deployment. So Margaret and I have put this together. Again, this will be shared in the pack, but we'll just step through and speak to it. Please pop your questions um, in the chat. So this document, we're talking about the difference between inactivation versus uh, non-activation time. So the 1800 hotline number um, is up the top there. That is always available um, to be called. So all hours you can call that for emergency info. So that's during the day um, and uh, after hours. I know this, this group is pretty familiar with that, but after hours really is just for emergencies only. And then during business hours, you can get emergency info if you need it um, and non-emergency info and questions and advice. So that's always there is the backup net if you need it. Um, just after hours, it's really just for um, emergencies only. 
Recently, we've had some changes to the system. So uh, we now actually have an answering machine that is in effect during the day. So our lovely CASI call operators pick up that phone for us during the day, but they might be on another call. So if you do get through to an answering machine, please just leave a message and leave your number and someone will get back to you um, right away. The big red line in the middle where it says deployment. So this is the reporting lines and the help contact when you're on deployment. So you've got the 1800 number there as your backup, but when you're on deployment, your first port of, port of call really is reading the SMEACs um, on REDS. We do try and keep that as up to date as we can. You know, sometimes when we've got lots of sites open and lots of SMEACs to write, there might be a little bit of a delay, but that is your core um, central piece for information. And if you're a team member, whether you're response or proactive or in the IMT and you're on deployment, your first port of call or, or first escalation point is to your team leader while you're on shift. And then the team leaders on shift, then they report to the field operations officers. If we've got one in place, we don't always, but if we do, you'll report up to the field operations officer and then to the operations unit into the IMT. And then if the operations unit need to escalate something, they'll escalate that up to the commander. Um, and the last port of call there is uh, the Vic ES state manager, which the commander can contact. So in a deployment, read your SMEACs first and then just keep reporting up. So team member to team leader, team leader to field operations officer or the IMT ops unit, and then the ops unit up to the commander and to the state manager. Hey, Abby, thank you so much for running us through everything that uh, we need to know in terms of our escalation points through uh, when there is a deployment happening, when there is an activation in place. Um, the other side of that and why I'm going to take a few minutes of everyone's time is to walk through what happens for all the other times. So obviously uh, it may not it may not feel like it, but there are times where we're actually not activated or you might not be activated and you're looking to make sure, and we get this question a lot, you're looking to make sure about where you get your information from and, and what your line of reporting is. So uh, here, I hope this is uh, something that will make things a little bit clearer. So obviously we still have that 1800 number uh, that is available to you, especially during business hours if you have questions uh, for information and advice. So really that is a backup for you and I'll, I'll explain why in a moment, but they, we will always be there for you on that 1800 number if you need um, outside of an emergency in business hours if you need some information or advice. It may be that you need to leave a message on the answer machine and we'll get back to you um, as, as we can, um, but that number is there for you. We also have a help desk which, uh, which the team has been trialling over the last few months and the beauty of the help desk is that it is a link which, uh, which we share in the state office report, we'll share in the pack again here. It's a link you can click to go through a series of questions to get help, like to self-help, um, to, to self-service help. It means that you might have some questions that we can help direct you to where the answers are. Uh, so you don't have to wait for, um, for a human to, to help you through that. The help desk is logged, so it means that if you've gone through and you've actually listed um, that you've got a question, we've got track. We can keep track of it, so your your question is not lost in someone's answer machine if they're on leave or in someone's inbox if they're on leave. It's actually logged, and there will be a member of the team to help you with that. It's in the early parts of the trial, um, so we are improving it as we go along but it is absolutely something that we've had some really good feedback from uh, recently and we'll continue doing it um, until we hear otherwise. So I think that's going to be helpful for you. So the 1800 number and the help desk are, are your good points of call for information. But there are times and more often than not when you actually need to speak to a human being and um, that's exactly um, what I'd like to take you through now. So if you're a team member, you can see up on the screen here, if you're a response a proactive team member, you might be part of the IMT as a team member, then your next point of um, escalation or the next point of contact for your questions will be your team convener or your IMT unit lead. Um, after that, 
the contact for the IMT unit lead or the team convener, uh, actually mostly for the team convener in this case, will be the divisional operations officer. So there's a chain of uh, command that happens outside of activations through to the divisional operations officer. The divisional operations officer, who do they report to? Well, they report to the volunteer leadership support officer uh, and they can go to that person that, um, and that's in uh, is Shana Ainsworth and it is Bianca Liu who are on the line uh, here today. But Shana and Bianca are your volunteer leadership support officers and they're the ones who can direct you into the right, um, the right place, give you the right information or understand what your concern might be and they can help fix that. If some time has gone on and you haven't heard back or perhaps you uh, haven't had a satisfactory um, resolution of your question and your inquiry or your problem, then you can escalate that up even further to me or to Abby as a coordinator. Uh, and there's also some state leads you could escalate to, but primarily it would be to Abby or myself as coordinators. Uh, hopefully we've managed to catch all the problems along the way, but occasionally something does slip through to the keeper and the keeper is the VQES state manager. Um, I see a few people smiling on the screen because there have been times, unfortunately or fortunately, that you've had the opportunity to talk to our state manager um, to get some, um, some traction on something. What we'd like you to do is to go through this um, particular chain of um, lines of reporting as much as possible because it actually helps, uh, it helps us make sure that it's a pretty smooth process and we endeavour really to make sure it's a smooth smoothest process and that you get the information that you need along the way and that we're able to equip the right people um, in that little chain of command there with the information that they can help you with. So I've gone through just checking our, uh, our te that telephone number and the help desk and a little bit of the, the chain of commands outside of activation. But what happens when we've got these lovely colours here, this blue, this purple and this red, what happens in between, which is when things have been going nice and calmly, but all of a sudden there is a request from council to um, for a Red Cross to activate. So there's a need now for Red Cross to activate. It might be for a relief centre or it might be something else. You can see at the top, uh, on the top right of the screen, there's a little, um, lots of two-way arrows. So when the council calls to activate, they may call uh, directly to the divisional operations officer because the Divi divisional operations officer and the council have a really good close working relationship. If, if that call comes to activate to the divisional operations officer, the divisional operations officer can then take action. One of the things we do ask is that they call the 1800 number for advice uh, and also just to keep us in the picture of what's happening. Uh, it, and um, then we can also help support uh, you as a division operations officer and your division and team to activate. Um, it can also go the other way around where the council can call the state duty officer and the state duty officer can take the, um, the call, what's happened, find out what's happened and then call the DevOps officer um, and let them know that this is what's happening in their division. So it, it can be, uh, can go either way. The main thing here is that our council are able to reach who they need to, to activate um, Red Cross and that the divisional operations officer where this one is in place is really aware of what's happening in their patch. And that's usually best between that council to DevOps officer relationship um, part of that there. Uh, as Abby was saying, uh, the state duty officer, that telephone number will take you to either the after hours service who will, who is a call, has a very set script for is it an emergency um, or during the day it will go through to the CASI team, thank you CASI team, who will help triage to make sure he's, um, who it needs to go to and they'll, they'll um, know who is best to connect with. It may be um, that if it is an activation request that it goes through to the operations team so they're able to support you best with that. So they're the three things here. The 1800 number is so important. Outside of activation, there certainly are reporting lines that we can have and we really encourage you to use. And also the activation procedures around um, when that telephone call comes from council. Um, I'm going to pass back over to Abby in a moment and Abby and, and Tony who've got a few um, uh, Going to, um, Tony's going to answer a few questions, I think. Um, but before I do, just to remember, and we'll pop it in the chat tonight too, that 
this, um, if you do have any other issues that you may want to um, contact our, um, our EAP, our Employment Assistance Program, uh, and also the independent wellbeing checks do come through down uh, the line afterwards. So this isn't the end. There, um, there is often a, um, a follow up that you can have either comes to you or that you can access if you do need further help. It's sort of in terms of your wellbeing and putting in some strategies around keeping yourself well. Um, I note, um, Colleen, you've got a question, but I, I might, uh, if it's okay, can you pop it in the chat, Colleen? No, I can't because it doesn't work on the system I'm on. It says only members are entitled to go into the chat. So, Margaret, uh, uh, so, sorry to. Sorry yeah, to Joe. Hi, Colleen. Um, it's Joe here. So, um, yeah, we're going to have some space for a moment in, on some questions, and um, we will address that issue that some people have got with the chat function. But I'll, so we'll get to that, Colleen. Don't worry. I won't. No, get thanks. Great, thanks, um, thanks, Joe, and thanks, Colleen. So um, I'm going to hand back over to Abby and Tony, who are just going to tease out some of these, um, some of the nuances for you. So thanks, Abby and Tony. Back to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks to Tony as well. Just to give a bit of context to some of these um, uh, more familiar uh, situations that that happen quite often with the divisional operations officers. So. Um, Tony, what's your relationship like with your local council and how does it work when they um, are requesting an activation from Red Cross? Uh, yep, we're pretty lucky. We've got a pretty good relationship um, both ways. The, the communication works both ways, but they're pretty good that they know that the state duty officer or the 1800 number is the first contact. Um, if they have any problems, they might give me a ring and say, you know, we can't get onto anybody that um, usually it goes through the right channels. Thanks, Tony. And sometimes local council just come directly to you? Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Great. And in especially, that situation... Especially if, they've got, yeah, especially if they've got somebody filling in a, a position, you know, it's not the normal council emergency management officer or something like that, so... Yeah. And in that situation, Tony, what do you ordinarily do if, if they've come direct to you, which is absolutely fine and you guys have those local connections so yeah i usually just pass it on give um the state duty officer or somebody a ring yeah and um it, it depends what it involves if it's just a simple thing they they can handle it themselves and ring the 1800 number but if it's something that they they're not sure about sometimes it's easier for us to explain right Thank you. And from all your experience um, on deployment in relief centres and deploying team members um, in relief centres, how does the cha chain of command work with Red Cross people in a relief centre? Okay, in a, in a relief centre, um, doesn't matter whether you're the team convener or the DevOps officer, if you're in a relief centre, it's the team leader that's in control. They manage the team. They're the ones that communicate with the council and other agencies um, and the IMT. Um, or ops if we're activated, of course. But um, yeah, the team leader is the person, the go-to person. Um, yeah, they're the, they're the ones. I mean, team members talk to other agencies and whatever, but it's the team leader has the responsibility of doing the official communication side of it and managing the team while, right. they're, on, while they're on shift. Yeah. So following the red line on deployment um, there on the graphic. Yeah. Great, thanks. Does anyone else have uh, any questions that they would like to ask Tony in relation to reporting lines um, on deployment or at any other times? Um, Tony, just for um, new people, what do you do if you can't get on to anyone? You know, if the lines are busy or the lines are down, how do you manage that sort of act, act or problem? Devil's advocate question, sorry. Yeah, um, just manage it best, as best we can. Um, if it's if it's a simple um, single incident, so something that we can manage without too much trouble, we just go ahead and do it. Um, but there's always somebody, always got a phone number for somebody that we can we can contact. Um, yeah, I don't think we've ever been in that position. It might be a bit of a delay, but sometimes, <coughs> sorry. Just like in the recent storms, we had no communication at all. So we, we had no phone, we had no computer, we had nothing. So 
sometimes it's just um, do what you can do, follow the procedures. And if, if you follow the, the chart and you follow the guidelines, the team leader list, checklist, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. That's a fabulous answer. Thank you so much. That's a really great answer. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. you. I think that's that back over to Emma. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tony, Margaret and Abby for that presentation. Um, I know that we have some time now for some questions um, and I'm not a very technical person, so I'm going to hand over to Joe, who's um, managing the whole situation with the chat situation. So I'm going to hand over to Joe and he'll manage all the questions that you guys have. So. Thanks, Emma. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, we'll go to we might have about 10 minutes here. Um, we, we're not going to have all night for, for questions and discussion as much as I would like that, but we will have sort of 10 minutes here for some questions. So use the raise hand function uh, up the top of Microsoft Teams if you can. Um, I'm aware some people have got some challenges with the chat function tonight, which apologies for that, um, but we will plow ahead. Uh, I've popped some things in the chat. You can send through your questions to an email address in there um, and they won't get lost. So if we don't get to everything tonight, we will make sure they're followed up. Uh, so please feel free to use that and email them through if the chat's not working for you. But otherwise, we might go to Colleen. Um, so feel free to bring up a question here from something you've seen in the presentation so far. Um, we'll go to Colleen first and then we'll go, go ahead. So thanks, Colleen. Um, it looks like some great work's been done because I personally find the internal bureaucracy of the Red Cross sometimes impenetrable um, as a volunteer. So I think you've really taken a lot of notice. How will this affect REDS, which is the one part of being a volunteer that I just find impossible? So thanks. Colleen, and great question. Um, I'm going to very cheekily here manoeuvre and pass that one along. Um, Abby, do you do you have a a take on that one in regards to these system, these systems and 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 Reds especially? Um, yeah, I know Reds. We've um, I guess a, a a pretty exciting update is um, I'll let the cat out of the bag that. Within the next year, hopefully a little bit sooner, we'll be moving away from Reds, um, and we're moving to a new system. I've got some, I've got some cheers in the crowd here. So, we've been pretty heavily involved in a um, in a working group that includes all uh, representatives from each state and territory. We've we've pretty much spent six months mapping out every single user story across Australia. So. What do the DevOps officers need? What do team leaders need? What do team conveners need? What does the IMT need? What does, you know, what does Margaret need from Red? So I, I can safely say that we have left no stone unturned with that. We had a small Victorian working group as well, which um, I fed all of our feedback back into the national working group. So current status of that project is that all of our huge amounts of feedback is with some very clever developers to build the forms exactly or build the system how we would like um, to see it. And the expected anticipated rollout day, date is around um, April to June next year. So I probably can't solve all the problems with REDS um, now, but I think the flavour is to look towards the future and we'll have a you know new shiny system that's a little bit more fit for purpose next year. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Joe. Um, and I saw some um, some uh, applauses there from Mick and Colleen, so um, and Lulu as well. So um, I don't see another hand up at this stage. If the hand's not working for you and someone wants to jump in, you've got the chance now. Marg, Marg and Alan Benson. Can't hear you at the moment, Alan. Just, it, you unmuted Alan and it just went off again. But. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Abby, following on from that, is it, this new system 
going to be a standalone thing like Reds, or is it tied into some other pre-existing uh, communication channel? You'll be very pleased to know, Alan, that it's actually a part of the suite of our um, DC D365 app. So, you know, when you go into My Apps and you've got all the Microsoft apps there. So it's called uh, D365, Dynamics 365. One of the key, very key discussions that we've had that everybody um, is really pushing for is that it's linked with PageUp. It's linked as much as possible um, with Mavis and the other systems that we use in Red Cross. So we're not using two or three different systems. We know that's a big challenge with Reds that it doesn't speak to anything else and it's quite manual. So I probably don't have all the guarantees on the table now, but it is a really big part of the um, conversation that we must start looking at things that are linked with other systems. So we stop doing these manual processes to have up-to-date profile and information. So the problems that quite a number of our team in particular have on getting into page up will be fixed before that happens? I, I probably can't speak too too much to, to that, um, Alan. Look, I would hope so. I, it's definitely been identified as, as a problem, so I would hope so. But I, I probably the bit I'm speaking to is that when you complete something on page up, what we're hoping is that, that it shows on your new um, profile um, so there's no manual um, updating on your REDS profile when you've completed training. I'm also happy to, maybe we can get some feedback. I'm happy to run it, um, you know, at another time, a quick little overview of where we're at with the project if people are keen um, to see where we're at and share all the information I know with you. I've been putting little snips in the State Office report as I get them, but maybe happy to get together as a group, um, possibly one of the leaders' lounges. Abby, um, if I can help you with the second part of Alan's question there, which is around page up, um, we, uh, we've we heard pretty loud and clear people's um, troubles getting into page up and there's a piece of information I can give you is that the psychological first aid, uh, introduction to psychological first aid on, on page up was people were finding their way into page up and making their way halfway through and then it was hanging. That's actually been resolved. We've had reported from the national team that, that particular problem with introduction to psychological first aid has been fixed. So um, if anyone, uh, if you want to test it, if, there, if you have a problem with that, please let us know. Um, but we believe that the introduction to psychological first aid, uh, the hanging problem has been fixed and now we're making sure that we're feeding up what other problems there are so those things can be remedied along the way. And we're using the help desk for that, um, if you can give us information. It's not all perfect, but that little bit is um, has a tick to it now. Thanks, Alan, for bringing it up, though. Thanks, Margaret. Um, and you got a thumbs up there from Alan, I, I saw. Um, We've got Gillian next uh, and then Tony. And at that point, we may have to move on to the next part of the session. But again, please, um, there's no silly questions here. Um, two years ago when I started Red Cross, there was a lot I didn't know about Red Cross. Uh, and just jump in, um, email them through if you have a question, please, uh, we want to hear from you. So we'll go to Gillian, then to Tony, and then we'll, we'll go to our next part. Gillian. It was just... Um... I wanted to, needed to redo my PFA um, and I had a bit of trouble getting in initially and I was told to go into my apps and then go to page up, which I did initially, but I didn't finish the course all in one go. Um, and then when this morning, when I went to try and do it, I wasn't able to do it. So I was sent a direct link by the help desk team. This to me is confusing and makes it very difficult um, for a not apt user of technology. So um, is there any way of fixing that or is it just my lack of skill? Um, Gillian, I might answer that one for you. Um, it's, um, 
the, it, when, you, when it comes to skill, I think it's actually about us trying to make sure that it's easy for people to access. So while I won't actually, I think you're very skilled, I won't necessarily address the skill part of it. Um, there are there are a range of of little bugs that come up all the way through, um, and we've we've heard them with with the training, uh, with the page up training. Some when it works well, it works beautifully, and people have had a good experience. That's fantastic. But with those sorts of things, if you can log that on the help desk, um, and, and unfortunately you've got a bit of a circle there where you've got something that's come through and hasn't helped um, you. But also if you have got that problem and you haven't got, haven't made it through, go back to having a look at that um, the line and give us a ring and let us know about it. Um, I'm sorry that it's been a circular problem there for you. What we're trying to do is work out what the nature of the problems are so that we can actually get them fixed. And um, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you offline, Gillian, if that helps. Thank you, Margaret. But yeah, I actually used the link that Help Desk sent to me, but I thought, do I need to save this so I can put it into my browser next time I want to go back and continue on with my um, training? Or do I go back to using my apps, page up training and that way I just it's just too confusing yeah I, I understand that Gillian and also too I can't really comment because I'm not sure what the link is that's been sent but what I can do is follow up with the team tomorrow and just understand what that is mm. for everybody else here online uh, what we will be doing by the end of the week is actually providing another uh, a document for you which actually shows you the um, uh, page up and the PFA skills and gives you a pathway through for that so hopefully that will give you some of that clarity um, with the PFA skills, because we know that that's a problem. Okay, other question is, other communications. We've had these um, Red Cross email addresses all set up, and I find I'm wading through far too many emails that are pertaining only to staff, not to volunteers as such. Mm. Is there a way of addressing that or something? Otherwise, it just, uh, I, we, we're we getting bombarded. Mm. Um, Gillian, I heard that today from somebody else as well. So, um, and I'll have a chat with Abby uh, and see what we can do in terms of, of that. It just, it's, on, it, it's one of those things you're on a list, I think, um, where you're mm. getting a lot of staff related emails. I don't know what we can do about that, but what we will do um, is I'll have a chat to Abby and see if there's something that we can do. And I'll let you know in the state office report. Um, Thank you. Because I, I, I understand that. Thank mm. you very much, girls. Much appreciated. I'll say goodbye Thanks, now. <laughs> Thanks, well, Hang on, but I'll just shut up. <laughs> no, 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 good, no, good, great questions, Gillian. And thanks, Margaret, for. Um, uh, taking those, um, Tony, uh, you had your hand up, so give you the give you the floor. But no, it's, it's we will fine. move along I'll, in a, a minute. No, it's so. fine. I'll I'll wait till the breakout rooms. It'll probably come up there, so it's it's fine. Okay, sure. Um, on that note, it, we've had a lot of information tonight. We've had some presentations, which I think have been really valuable. But let's just um, lighten it all down for a little while. So for the next around ten to fifteen minutes. We're going to send everyone away into breakout rooms. Um, and we talked this year a lot about wellbeing, about keeping our cup full, um, self-care strategies, um, learning to say no, and having the confidence to say no and to step back from it all. Um, so we've, and we've heard a lot of great things, I think this year, we've heard a lot about what people are doing, um, some strategies they're implementing in their life to look after themselves and be ready and healthy for the next emergency should they choose to get involved. Um, there'll always be another event. There'll always be another big activation um, and we can't always say yes to everything. So on that note, I'm just gonna do the tech here for 30 seconds or so and send everyone into breakout rooms. But this time around in the breakout rooms, we'd like to go around the table and, and hear from everybody. Um, so I'll leave that to each room to facilitate. Um, to make sure you go around the table, um, hear from each other about what strategies you're using. And I'm also going to assign um, one person in each breakout room to capture a, like, a light summary of that, because I feel like we're going to get some really great suggestions here and some things we haven't thought of. 
and we'd really like to capture that tonight and, and share that more widely. So look out for some announcements that jump into the breakout rooms, but um, I'll shut up now and I'll start setting up the rooms and you'll disappear in hopefully 30 seconds, but you might have to give me one minute. So I believe they're opening. <laughs> the wheel is spinning on my end, so hopefully you'll disappear. Um, kept them smaller rooms tonight, so it'll be, um, yeah, hopefully it's a bit of fun. See you back shortly. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi, Kat again. Hi, all. Um, it just it's, it's a few people are still disappearing, moving around. So, um, hi, Kathy, Chris Berry, Carla, uh, and Andrew Guest. Um, but that might be someone else on a on someone else's teams. It looks yeah. like. Yeah. Um, it's Michelle. Kat, hi, Michelle. Kat and Hello. Colleen, Adele, and. Penny, um, I'm going to mute and put my sound down and my video off because I need to do a few things here. But um, so I'll be out of this room, but you might still see my name here. But uh, yeah, enjoy the next sort of 10, 15 minutes and see you back shortly. <laughs> And if if someone uh, just before I do disappear, if someone wants to um to get the ball rolling, please do. Um, I might might jump through to you, Kathy, to to kick it off. But yeah, we're, the idea for anybody who came in late here is to share some um what we're doing in our lives to look after ourselves and um keep our well being good and self care strategies um and take it from there where you will. Uh, chat, connect with other volunteers across the state. Um. What are you seeing and hearing about the summer ahead? And yeah, just take it where you will, but I'll disappear now. I'm. OK, I think you passed it on to me, so I'll go first. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing to um, help myself in my life, but connecting, I guess, with family a fair bit to make life a bit more pleasant, seeing a little grandson a lot. Um, I worked out quite a while ago that it's OK to say no in Red Cross because it can take up basically as much as you're prepared to give. So saying no to things. Um, and I guess that's about it. In terms of the coming up summer, I um, guess I'm not as concerned as perhaps I have been in the past because the weather isn't looking too bad, although there's always the potential for grass fires. That's about it. So will I nominate somebody um, um, to go after me, Adele? Hi, I have planted a vegetable garden. It's now starting to produce, so I'm trying to figure out what to do with them all. <laughs> I live near you, Adele. Perhaps I should take some off your hands. Mine's still growing. <laughs> well, I'm expecting um, uh, quite a few pumpkins when they finally do. The zucchinis are going nuts. Um, yes, but and I do, I read a lot. I use my phone to contact people a lot, um, but I'm I'm quite happy just being at home really. And now I'm being a little bit more careful about going out because I've just learned that my nephew has it, oh. and he's double vaxxed. So he's still he's at home. He's fine, but because my sister is extremely immune compromised, that means that she can't see any of them. Oh. So that's a bit sad. So we might be doing Christmas in four corners of a park. Yes. <laughs> oh, worry. Who's next? Do you want to Do nominate want to somebody, somebody, Adele? Yeah. Well, oh, well, Colleen's the only name I can see. Okay. Um, okay. Um, 
it's Colleen Hartland here. I'm in the western suburbs. Um, gardening has always been my um, self-care technique. Um, but earlier in the year, um, I there were a number of house fires in the western suburbs and I was the team leader and I was dealing with them and back and forth to Red Cross because I thought it was completely out of the skill range of a volunteer to be dealing with people after a house fire. One of them was actually a murder and we couldn't offer these people anything. We were offering them um, psychological first aid, which simply wasn't enough. They all needed a case manager. Um, so learning to convey that and then say, no, I'm not going to do that again. You need someone. And I'm pretty skilled. I've worked in mental health teams. I know this stuff. But they needed someone long term, not someone just to ring them and have a chat. So learning to say no is incredibly important. Was that picked up, Colleen? I'm not entirely sure it was because, you know, there were three separate incidents all within a few weeks of each other and I was told I'll just find a volunteer and I said, I don't think that anybody in my team actually has that skill. I had worked in the mental health team, so, you know, I thought I had a fair bit of skill, but none of these people needed psychological first aid. They needed material relief and they needed a long-term case manager and they needed rehousing. And we either offer a complete package or we shouldn't offer anything because that's not what these people needed. So I did very strongly convey that. I'm not someone who's um, backwards about coming forward. Good. Mm -hmm. I know in our division we had... Um, a fire where a number of children were killed and a kindergarten wanted um, wanted a session to help the parents yep. of other people. Yep. Um, and we had Kate Brady come and do it mm. and she was excellent. Mm. So mm. that may be another option another time. Yeah. And I think though the, the issue was that these people actually oh. needed material aid and Yes. That's not particularly clear about where you get it and how you access it. And council was putting it on Red Cross, and Red Cross was back to council and could the sell vote. There was no clear package that you could actually offer these people. It should be in the MEM for that council. Um, yeah, I, that's who I was dealing with because all three fires actually occurred in the one council area and I got to know the person quite well but they weren't offering it it was no it just wasn't happening oh that's a shame yeah. our shire actually put, offered to put the fa our family just recently oh. in a motel um for several nights but because they had an animal they wouldn't accept it because they couldn't take their dog with them yeah they did find private accommodation and then they found long-term accommodation but she had a caseworker to start with yeah yeah. And the salvos were very involved in the accommodation part of things too. And with one particular family, I mean, this woman clearly had very long-term issues. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just the fire. It was, there were a whole range of things that had gone wrong in her life. So it's just that it's that um, making sure that we're not, you know, for me, offering a cup of tea and a chat mm. wasn't what, what these people needed mm. and they were one of them was offered temporary accommodation yeah yeah that's pretty nice we probably should move on so we get through everybody do you want to nominate somebody else to speak i, I can't actually see any i can see faces but i can't actually see names there's somebody the like with the very nice big earrings white earrings how's that yes <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Oh, is that working? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm Kat. I'm in Ballarat. It's easy to remember. Put the two together. Um, first, like um, for myself, I realised mid-year that I, I, I've got a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old, and I can't remember the last time I wasn't busy. And so, uh, at the end of October, I closed um, both of my businesses and sold one for enough money to give me a year off. So I am taking, this is the start of my year of me, 
and I want to learn as much as I can about all different things that I enjoy rather than just the things that I have to do because I have to do them. So uh, when it comes to personal care, I've really taken a big step in the past little bit and I'm very lucky to have been able to do that. Um, for the coming, for the season, I'm also in SES and I've taken a big step back into SES with my, I like to call it semi-retirement, um, and we're quite concerned about flooding and we're looking at quite a bit of preparation in to do that. But if I say, if you like my earrings, these actually say, you are my sunshine, which is my favourite song to sing with my kids. I will say, I'll pass this over to Chris, who's the only person I know. Thank you, Kat. What a surprise. <laughs> um, I'm also in Ballarat, and uh, my go-to for self-care is I've given myself a timetable to um, bring my garden back to uh, some sort of sensibility after a long winter and... Uh, extreme growth over the uh, the spring period. It sort of got out of control. And my other go-to is my four-legged fur babies, which consist of a couple of horses, a dog and a cat. Uh, so they're definitely my go-tos whenever I need. Um, with respect to the season coming up, um, we're still dealing with the storms that were here in June and also October. So we've got a week of outreach next week. So that's sort of kicking off the summer season for us and we'll see what happens next. So, and I can't see any names. So I think there's only probably three people that haven't. Um, so I've got, a lady down in the corner that looks like she's sitting, leaning against her bed. So over to you. Oh, thank you. That's me. <laughs> I feel a little bit embarrassed about it, actually. I realise that. <laughs> and my name's Carla. Um, and, um, yeah, so I work full time still. So, um, yeah, I'd love to be spending more time in my garden, but I guess my go-to is um, just trying to have a walk and be outside like I really like just getting the air and getting the balance of being outside and doing that sort of stuff. Um, I guess I'm someone who's – I was interested before in um, – so, like, I'm trying to be a Red Cross volunteer, but I can't seem to actually – cross the line to I've done a lot of training but I can't cross into actually doing volunteering which is quite weird um so um yeah so I think I'd, I'm kind of keen to do some more um but so it was interesting to hear a bit of a conversation about the complexity of the bureaucracy and the systems um so maybe I just need to try a bit harder but otherwise I mean, in terms of the last couple of years of the pandemic, I feel I've been very lucky and been able to kind of manage reasonably well, although I feel the loss of family connection, you know, as we all do. Yeah, so thanks. Um, so I have to ask someone else. And I'm going to ask the Andrew. And Andrew. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're not. Well. <laughs> no, that's my husband. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. La yeah, last week my microphone wasn't working. Um, yeah, my go-to sort of reading. I think reading is always a good way to escape and, um, and and relax. And I like walking and things like that. And getting away in our caravan, which um, we recently, well, we got last year. Actually, that's where I am at the moment. We've just come across to Inverloch for a week. So I'm sitting here in my caravan <laughs> looking forward to a, um, a relaxing week before we get back home and back into things. But um, I feel, I'm fairly new to Red Cross and haven't had a few opportunities to volunteer and get involved. But, um, yeah, keen to find more things to do and um, get more involved and, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Kat, get that kid under control. <laughs> mm. It's Penny. 
How are you? Now, hang on. Can you hear me? I yes. just recognised you, Penny. Yes. How are you? Good. My hair's got longer. Um, my go-to depends on um, what the weather's doing, really, what's happening. Um, I'm very envious of everyone in their garden. I can do certain bits, but we have um, my place is a quagmire. I live in Far East Gippsland on, go on the edge of the Snowy River, and it is just wet, wet, wet. So uh, I've gave up on the garden a lot. You need gum boots and you need, like, it's a rice paddock. I could grow rice down here at the moment. That would be a good thing. Um, I, I do, I've been doing a lot of sewing. I've, I've uh, you know, been trying to finish off these multitude of things that keep me going. And as far as getting ready for this year, we still, I still think we're coming out of from two years ago because where I was in the middle of the fires, that's where it, being sort of surrounded and you still have um i've been heavily involved with the as far as i can with uh the member thing so now i'm i'm doing a lot more in that regard uh so like i think i think i'm i'm the zone seven chair yay don't ask me no one volunteered so i'm it um so it's sort of <laughs> so it keeps you going in that regard but um, as I said to someone, we're, we're just doing uh, selling raffle tickets at the moment, and that's been fantastic. You had people come up and say, where were you last year? Because we have this massive raffle, and we're going to raise about $2,000 in Orbos. But it's um, it's still people still live the fires here, and you, you have incidents come up, and they will, um, you know, there's people still hear fire sirens or whatever. It can trigger a lot of people off here. Uh, and we did a lot of uh, farm first aid. Our uh, group were doing catering, and we were going at little places like Combayan Bar. Remember that name? Combayan Bar, Club Terrace, um, mm -hmm. Bem River, Orbost, and uh, you will have people, and they just were happy to to get together again because they their communities have been some of those like Combayan Bar have been ravaged. Um, so. It's sort of trying to get people back together, connecting, and I've been enjoying that. Um, I've been you know, turning down. I do casual relief teaching still, trying to get rid of that, Adele. Um, <laughs> but it takes a lot of time. But, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, just depends what I'm doing. If I'm really mad, I go on a fitness campaign, but that lasts about a week and then it's disaster because I hurt myself. But, you know. Mm. And then I've got like grandchildren around that I can now see, so I'm on deck this week with them. But that's um, yeah, get looking forward to this year, and seeing if we can implement some programs like the pillowcase training would be great because we've been geared up for two years and haven't been. I, we've done one session of it up here, um, but that's about it. Okay, back to whomever. I can see I can there's see somebody some called AW who hasn't spoken. I think. Can you see that, everybody? I've got a JP and an AW at the I bottom think of the JP is probably Joe, Joe Park. But is AW there without their camera on? AW says on hold. Alice West on hold. Oh, well, she's on hold. Details, so I guess what that means. She's probably waiting in a room somewhere in the dark <laughs> by herself. <laughs> Um, Carla, it struck me you were saying how you're having trouble getting involved as such, being activated. Where are you? I in I live in Ascot Vale. Um, so you're a city. Yeah, but also I've been also in the wind in the lockdown. I've been living in um, South Gippsland, oh. so I'd be happy to get involved in either location. Another South Gippslander. So we're in South Gippsland. Gippsland. In um, Currumbarra. Oh, you're joking. We've got a place that's where I Adele. am. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And that's where Adele is. Oh, oh it's a... <laughs> you both are with your veggies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So they live on a hill and the water drains away. I live on a hill and the water drains away too, but the wind blows. True. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that thing about, you know, getting active is I think I was – in Red Cross for about 10 months before I did my first thing and that was Ben's uh, Relief Centre. It's kind of like that thing of it may not be much going on and then suddenly 
there's something huge where they will need this for weeks and weeks and weeks. I don't, I, is that other people's experience? Yes, we're um, hearing you. Yeah. Can you get on. contact us? Yeah. yeah, can I contact you too, both? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Kat, did you get on? Hi, hi everyone. Welcome back. Sorry, um, I had to do a sneaky mute there just so we didn't get too much background noise. But um, thanks for thanks for that. And I'll, I'll be touching base with someone from each room, and we'll capture some of those great ideas and uh, share them around. So look out for that. Um, I know a couple of people, as always, had, there was a couple of little tech things, um, but I managed to move some people around in some rooms, so thanks for your patience with that. And um, yeah, I think from where we've come from before we were using these systems at all, um, I think, yeah, we'll take that. And uh, I saw some, um, some, some, uh, heard some great conversations in the chat room I was in briefly before I had to leave. So, um, and good to see your guest again tonight, Kat, as well. Um, so I'm going to pass back to Emma. Um, we've got a great little session now um, for some of the other parts of VicAS, and I'll throw it to Emma, and you can introduce that. Thanks. Thanks, Joe, and thanks so much for my group. We had some some great laughs and some great chats. So even that is just part of being well, part of your well-being is just having a smile and a laugh and a chat. So that's great. Thank you for my team for giving me a laugh tonight. So I would like to hand over to a team that's very close to my heart. I looked after them for a while as their leader. Um, so I'd like to hand over to um, the Carver, uh, Kazi and the COVID team um, to, and the food relief team to give you a little bit of a news flash as they're describing it um, in uh, what they do and some of the important work that they do, just so that you can uh, keep this in mind while you're going out and about and, and um, in your communities. So I'd like to hand over to uh, Flinny or Andrew, um, if he's around. I am around, absolutely. And thank great, you thanks. so much for um, that great opportunity for the breakout rooms. And thanks for that, Emma, and facilitating tonight. Um, I just want to say a big warm welcome um, to everyone. This is going to be a short and sharp session on the sort of COVID response that we're still currently in, because who would have known we're in a pandemic during the summer readiness period. So some of you may or may not experience the times where you go out to an activation and um, while you're in that activation, you may um, meet, come across people who are still experiencing the pandemic for the first time. They may have gone into lockdown for the first time. They may have gone into um, test isolation for the first time and not know how to deal with those uh, circumstances. So as you are the uh, the boots on the ground, we want to make sure that you've got the best support possible for both the activation and the COVID pandemic side of things. So this is just a short little session from Arden and myself to uh, to give you a brief update on, um, on the COVID world and what we're doing in response and how you can uh, touch base with um, the CASI hotline and refer people through to its support and what those people will get. So without further ado, I have a little presentation because I'm fancy and stuff. And that presentation, I'm just going to share the screen. It may work. And if someone can just call out, if you can see my screen right now. Yep. We've got good. you, Andrew. Yep. Yep. Thanks for that. All right. So you may be able to see here, this is uh, the amazing Susan, Susan McDougall. And it's got to do with food relief for people in mandatory isolation and also um, social, emotional and practical support for people in isolation. And that's what we do in the, the COVID program. We're supporting people with both emergency food relief for people in mandatory isolation, but also for that social, emotional and practical support for people who aren't in uh, mandatory isolation, but for people who are just experiencing isolation because they're either scared to go out, they they may have a low immune system or be immunocompromised and not want to go out into the community. And so these two programs, they sit side by side, but serve a slightly different community. So um, for anyone out there who is meeting people that are isolating themselves, who are not in mandatory isolation, but are just isolating in their houses. They may be disconnected from their family, friends and community. They may, uh, because their local community groups have closed down, their local mahjong, their local bowls club, 
uh, neighborhood houses may not be running programs that they have run in previous years. They may be completely disconnected from um, the services and the people that normally give them their updates and their information about services that can support them. For those isolated people, it must be a pretty scary time. And if they're not very good at Googling or Google is not a, a great product in um, doesn't bring up localized support services for them in their local community areas, um, they may feel really, really lonely. And this is a massive issue that has come out of COVID of people being disconnected from family, friends and community. And that's where the Cassie hotline comes into it. So if you meet someone along the way um, that you can support them getting back into their community groups, do that look, listen and link. Um, and that's absolutely perfect. But if for some reason you don't have the time or the ability to do that look, listen and link in that role, you can always refer them back to the Victorian State Hotline, which is 1800 675 398. And that's 1800 675 398. That's the Victorian State COVID Hotline. And they can press option five, and then press the sub menu option three, which is not confusing at all, but option five, option three, and they can get through to one of our CASI operators. Now our team operate from eight o'clock in the morning till 6 p.m. at night, and they're there to provide that standard PFA. What do we do with PFA? We look, not too easy over the phone, but what we really do is listen and link people through to their local services and state level services. Um, I've got a little, um, map here that shows you kind of like the Red Cross person sitting in the middle and getting a call from Mavis or Karen or Bruce and it comes through and the Red Cross staff member or volunteer refers them out to all the services that are available either at the state level whether it's national hotlines to do with vaccine information or uh, mental health counselling for people who are isolated or partners in wellbeing for people that need maybe to develop a health mental health plan while they're in isolation, all the way through to people who may be in need of emergency relief food packs but don't know how to get them, we can refer them through to the option on the hotline for that. But where we specialise and what we do, we try and do the best we possibly can is link people through to localised services like their local gut councils, local food relief or material goods or local shopping services that can help elderly people or people who are isolating to be able to access those things like online shopping or shopping to the door. Um, sometimes you'll see people that come through that need to be connected to like online churches or online book clubs because they're too scared to re-engage with their local community groups. These are the types of things that take a person from being isolated to feeling connected to humans again and to other people. And that's what we try and do our best to do. The other side of things is a mandatory food, uh, mandatory isolation. So if a person's in mandatory isolation because they've tested positive or they're awaiting their test results or they're a close contact to someone who has tested positive, they may have to mandatorily isolate for 14 days. And if they had no food in their house and they didn't have a credit card and they're going through a situation in life that doesn't allow them to get out, that's where the mandatory food isolation support helps out. For, uh, 14 days worth of food for four people or seven days worth of food for four people, depending on what situation they're in. Arden will speak more to that because she's the expert on that. But you can call the Victorian hotline again, 1800 675 398, option four just straight through to option four and they can get that emergency mandatory uh, food relief. And that really does help people out. So just once again, um, while you're going through your activations and, the, and you're getting ready for your summer bushfires with your teams, just remind them that there is a pandemic happening at the moment. We're in a watch and wait for what this Omicron looks like from uh, South Africa, but we just are conscious about what's happening in the pandemic space as well. And we're here to link people back to those local services and make sure that they're connected to family, friends and community to avoid that loneliness, isolation and a potential depression that can happen with COVID. But that's me done for the day. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'll hand over to the amazing Arden Ha. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for that great presentation and handover. <laughs> um, <laughs> as most of you, or, or hopefully some of you know, um, I'm Arden, so I'm Operations and Logistics Support Officer. Um, and I'm just going to have a quick overview for you guys to give you an update of the main things that will be happening with the food relief program over the summer period. Um, so I'll just run you through the changes in our food pack configurations. 
um, are planning for the holiday times and also safety and wellbeing. So in regards to the changes in food pack configurations, um, as most of you know, during food relief, we've been giving free food packs and one um, personal care item, and that constitutes one food box for someone in 14-day um, isolation and for a, a family of four people. So that will remain the same for anyone who's in 14-day or 10-day isolation. So they'll still get free food boxes and one personal care pack. Um, however, as we all know, they have the government has changed a lot of their regulations of isolation and some people will find themselves in a seven day isolation. And so we've changed that food pack in uh, food pack configuration to be two food boxes and one personal care box. So if you are doing a food delivery, you will be told if it will be a seven day or 14 day isolation by the logs officer on the day. Um, but if you have any questions about that at the time, then feel free to reach out to us. Um, and any other future transitions or updates to the food relief program, we will be providing updates in the state office report. Um, so the next thing that we just want to brief you on is just planning over the holiday period. So we are currently doing our planning for the Christmas and the New Year's time. We'll update the DevOps officers with these plans and we aim to have them completed by the end of the week. We are aiming with the best possible hope that we can give our volunteers a well-deserved break on Christmas Day and New Year's where possible, and we will let you know of the arrangements when they're confirmed. However, for the holiday period, please check in with your team to see if anyone wants to support with food relief. Um, we know that there's, in most divisions, there's a lot of people that are kind of just doing most of the um, delivery. So if you can try and reach out to see if there's anyone else in your team to help support and also give most of the team members that are currently doing it a break. That would be great. Um, and we can also help support making any arrangements to hand over to other team members. However, if you can't find any availability availability within your team, which is completely understandable because it's been a very busy two years and everyone's got a lot of priorities, then please let the Ops and Logs team know so that we can be prepared for the um, holiday period as well. And if you are interested in helping out with food relief um, for deliveries or log support, then don't forget to express interest in the Reds event. And then also just a little reminder and update on safety and well-being. So although restrictions have lifted across Victoria and we are experiencing more freedom, finally, and I hope everyone is enjoying some of that freedom, um, for food relief deliveries, please ensure that you do maintain the same COVID safe delivery process, um, which includes having all the necessary PPE and ensuring that there is no contact whatsoever with any food deliveries made and also giving them that quick call before you make the delivery to make sure they're not coming out as you should be briefed every time that you do the delivery. Um, it's also very important to ensure um, that you make so to ensure that you look after yourself and your team and make sure that everybody is having a break. It has been a very long two year period as we are all aware and for a lot of people that have been doing food relief it's been a bit of a non stop time. Um, so please do make sure you take a break everyone deserves it and everyone needs it and we're always more than happy to help and facilitate any um, time off that you need. So please don't um, hesitate to reach out to us if you need a break or if you're having any trouble supporting food deliveries. Remember that for us, our volunteers' wellbeing and safety is our top priority, so please don't worry about reaching out to us. Um, I also just wanted to highlight as well that if we do get activated for another event, please also try to balance your work and your responsibility with supporting food relief and another activation. Um, so we don't want, you know, people who are trying to do outreach or something and then also have to be maintaining any food deliveries as well. So if we do get activated for other events, please keep this in mind as well. And um, that's all from me. Thank you. I think I'll pass back to Emma. Any questions? Thanks. And just before Emma jumps in, I'll just remind everyone that we are um, we are running seven day, uh, five, five days a week for the Cassie hotline and seven days a week for the food relief hotline. So that is throughout the Christmas and New Year period. Um, all of those public holidays, the lines will be open. So if you're ever stuck trying to refer people to other services, just remember that's a backup plan for you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Em. Actually, I'm going to hand over to Joe. So. Just just very briefly, thanks Emma and, and thanks Arden and, and Flinny. And then look, the, um, uh, Arden and, and Andrew have been the faces there tonight and it was great to see you at the breaking news desk, um, Flinny. But yeah, I think they would both be the first people to acknowledge that there's 
so many people across the state and so many people in this room tonight who have been part of those programs and done huge amounts of work over the last 18 months or, or even potentially longer. Um, it was a great pleasure of mine and a great thrill this year to, it was a very challenging circumstances and it was, um, I, sh I shouldn't be sort of um, getting too excited about it, but to be involved uh, and help out with food distribution and meet some more volunteers out in the field was a real thrill and um, a highlight of the year, although it was very um, challenging circumstance. So thanks again for all everyone who's done an amazing amount of work in food distribution and in the CASI COVID programs and all the other things Red Cross do. Um, I'll throw it back to Emma and we're running to pretty well on time tonight, Emma, which is great. So I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to uh, do a wrap up. Uh, so thank you all to our uh, presenters tonight. You all did a fantastic job and it was really informative. I do know that there'll be lots of questions that probably come out of tonight. So please keep an eye on REDS, um, Red Alerts, State uh, Office Reports and the email address that Joe put in the chat. And there will obviously be the post um, pack that's coming out as well with a lot of the information too. Um, but by all means, please send through any questions that you have um, and the team will be more than happy to answer them uh, as they come along. Um, so that's all we have really for tonight, unless I have forgotten anything. Please jump in if I have. Um, but otherwise, I just really want to thank you all for coming along tonight. It's been wonderful to see you all. And thank you all for supporting Red Cross and all the people that you do support. I know, really appreciate it. And um, it's been wonderful to see you all. And if I don't see you all before, have a wonderful and relaxing Christmas and stay safe. So, I think Emma, I just want to say thank you so much for being a great host tonight. Um, really appreciated you jumping in and we think you've done a swell job. So well done. I hope you get to go and have some R&R &R now too, but congratulations on a nice job. I didn't do anything. You guys did all the work. So thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks thank a lot, Sam. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's like leaving good friends. <laughs>